Hello, BookTube. All right, we're at part three of our 12.1K Q&A, and we are up to Booknik. Uh, what, why didn't you surpass 12.1K until after you brought Deb back? She had nothing to do with it. Don't make her ego any bigger than it already is. She's a loser. A loser. <laughs> Uh, number two, when you get snowed into the 200-year-old Vermont house and the food runs out, who gets eaten first? My vote would be the cats, <laughs> but uh, we're well-stocked. I think we'll be fine, and we're not going to get snowed in. This, For once, the, the, Vermont's experience with this storm was not worse than Boston's. Usually it is, but for once, Boston is the one that's getting people getting snowed in. Uh, then, let's see here, Vigard Daly? says, which contemporary writer comes closest to matching the fluency, bite, and wit of your stated favorites, Austin, Elliot, Wharton, Wolf, McCarthy? Uh, oh, God. I would probably argue, uh, it's going to seem scandalous, but I would probably argue that it's happening in the commentariat rather than in books. Uh, but I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure that that kind of, what did you say? Fluency, bite, and wit is even possible. In the, 20 second, in the 21st century. I'm not sure that that's true. No no such coterie of authors is springing to mind, that's for sure. Uh, Alicia, you have, another, you have a lot of questions. Joy Williams' novel, Harrow, made it to your year-end list. What do you think of her short stories? I've liked them, but I think she's probably better suited to novels. Uh, what do you think of the Austrian writer Thomas Bernhardt? I think he's great. I've only read four of his novels, but I've never been disappointed by them. Uh, do you have a preferred length slash word count as a book reviewer, as a writer, not a reader? Uh, I don't know if it's preferred or if it's just conditioning. I, the average of book review that I have been writing for so long has been around 800 words. I don't know if now that's a preference or if I'm just so conditioned that I, I think about it that way. One thing's for sure, as a, re, as a writer of book reviews, longer things I don't think are my speed at all. I've written a great number of them. For the old Open Letters Monthly, I would write a 2,000-word piece every month. And some of them were, were almost twice that long. When, and the, but those were more historical or literary rambles about a subject. If you've got a book, a new book, I'm not sure that me, that most new books need more than 800 words. I had an editor once, actually, who used to say that uh, when I would when I would say, you know, what if I need a lot more than that? And she'd say, well, uh, most books don't need more than that. And if you're the reviewer, I think you are. You don't need more room than that. If you can't make your case for or against the book in 800 words, then what are you going to do in 1,600 words? There's a lot of wisdom in that. So I, 800 would be probably the, 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 the length here. Uh, let's see here. Will there be humans on Earth or elsewhere in, 20, in 2100 or 2200? Uh, my guess would be 2100, yes, 2200, no. Uh, and they won't be anywhere else. Uh, my guess would be that, that in 2200, well, maybe not no humans, but in twenty. But I think by twenty two hundred, huge tracts of this world will be unlivable by humans. They they won't be able to live there physically. Uh, so, uh, but twenty one hundred, no, uh, twenty one hundred is not is not that far away. So, uh, and on days with little or no walking, do you do calisthenics or any other exercise aside from playing with Frida? You know, I don't, and I really should. Even on days with walking, I really should. R light weight training even for somebody as old as the hills, <laughs> is, is a very, very good idea. And it's easy to do. You, it, It's easy to do. If you're worried that you're going to fall or anything like that, it, there are YouTube tutorials uh, by the thousands. I have a couple of, of metal, you know, single dumbbells. That's all you need to do the kind of thing that I'm talking about. And I should. I really should incorporate it into my daily routine. Maybe 2022 is a good time to start doing that. Uh, Joel Swagman says, historical rivalries. Who are you more sympathetic to? Gladstone or Disraeli? Jefferson or Hamilton? Edmund Burke or Thomas Paine? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the only one of these, I, or I have a dog in the fight, is Jefferson or Hamilton, and it would be Hamilton. But I, I, I tend not to take sides. Um, Zoe Archer says, hi, Steve. What do you think of reading true crime books? I have been enjoying them, but I have lately heard that we shouldn't be reading them as it is glorifying the criminal and giving them attention and disrespecting the victims. What are your thoughts on this? Okay. Thought number one, I'm very happy that you're enjoying them. Keep right on doing what you're doing. And thought number two, if you have heard from someone, if someone has said to you, the reading true, true crime makes you guilty of disrespecting the victim, that person is a fascist. There are plenty of people on BookTube who would tell you that they don't mean it. They don't care about whether or not 
that what they're saying is actually true. They don't actually think that reading a true crime book is disrespecting the victim. They only want to, to see whether or not they can use shame and implied threat to make you stop doing something. They don't care what something is. They just want to see if they can make you stop doing it. They don't hold the moral opinions they claim to hold. They don't think that it's disrespecting the victim and glorifying the crime. They don't think that. They're saying that in order to try to exercise power over you. They don't care how they do that. They just get off on exercising power. Can they make you stop doing it? So don't stop doing it. Just keep right on doing what you're doing. You are obviously not re disrespecting the victim of a crime to read a true crime book. Obviously you're not. So just, just ignore the fascists who are everywhere in our midst. <laughs> uh, Alan Black uh, says, uh, number one, what are your thoughts on Penguin publishing Marvel Comics in their Penguin Classic series? I love it. I mentioned this in, a, in the last installment. I love the idea. I think it's long overdue. I, these, these, if, considering some of the things that Penguin has published in the last, in the classics line, in the last few years, it's long overdue that these books have been read by 150 times as many people as most of the books that Penguin publishes. If that doesn't qualify them for classics, uh, they're not studied in school. But a lot of the stuff that Penguin has published in the last five years shouldn't be studied in school either. I think it's a great idea. It's long overdue. But I want to wait and see how the execution is. These are going to be larger than normal Penguin paperbacks, but smaller than comic books. So I'm worried that the print won't be legible. I'm worried that the colors won't jump out. We'll see. We'll see what kind of a job it does. Uh, number two. I really love The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. Can you recommend another haunted house story just as good? Um, probably a lot of them. I recommend How Fear Departed the Long Gallery uh, by E.F. Benson. How Fear Departed the Long Gallery. It's a, it's a long, short story, but it is terrific. And it's a haunted house story. It's really, really good. Uh, number three, what are your thoughts on the memoir called All That Remains, A Life in Death by Sue Black? Uh, I don't think I know that book. Uh, it doesn't ring a bell. And then... Uh, <clears throat> Scorchder Schwarter Chicken. Oh God, I don't get any better at that every time. Number one, do you like Led Zeppelin in general or just A Fool in the Rain? Ten Years Gone is also beautiful. I like a lot of what they do, not just Fool in the Rain. Uh, number two, thoughts on Emil Chorin? Many say he's one of the greatest masters of 20th century French language prose, <clears throat> but the one thing I know for certain is that his aphorisms are absolutely hilarious. I have not read enough of him to make a, a pronouncement on how good he is across the spectrum of French prose, but I agree with you. His aphorisms are priceless. Uh, let's see here. Number three. Since the last question was about a Romanian guy, I'll keep up with the theme. Thoughts on Eugene Ionesco? He's great. He's fantastic. Not as not well enough known. Usually, even in college, the only thing that people will know is rhinoceros, and that's a shame. Uh, number four. Uh, and completing the holy trinity of 20th century Romanian writers, thoughts on uh, Mircier Elevie? I know I'm slaughtering that name, and I don't. I I've read one thing by this author, and not particularly liked it. I'm not even remembering right now what the name of it was. So either I need to restudy that author, or they didn't do anything for me. But uh, is that the Holy Trinity? Isn't there a name you're leaving out? There's a name on Steve's mind that you're leaving out. Uh, number five. Any other Romanian writer recommendations? Yes, Mihail Sebastian. Mihail Sebastian is you is a Romanian writer, is he not? He should be in your trilogy, in your in your trinity. I, I'd wholeheartedly recommend him, anything you can find. Uh, PHX SNS1 says, number one, I'm not sure how long you've lived in Boston. Neither am I. <laughs> uh, but you have you ever seen the Celtics play? Yes. Yeah. Celtics, Bruins, uh, the Patriots out at Gillette Stadium, uh, the Red Sox many, many times. Yeah. Can't live in Boston and not do that. Uh, even if you're not a big sports fan, you can't live in Boston and not do that. Uh, number two, have you ever seen the documentary Town Bloody Hall starring Norman Mailer, Jermaine Green, Diana Trilling, and others? I've heard about it. I've never seen it. Uh, Ranch Elder says, do you have a favorite interpretation of late antiquity? Continuity versus catastrophe. God, I love you people so much. Uh, Peter Brown and Brian Ward Perkins are the two examples of modern scholars leaning in the respective directions. Of course, I lean with Peter Brown. But maybe came out wrong. <laughs> I, I am I am firmly in his case. Uh, people don't know that history is happening to them. Only once in a blue moon does that happen. We all know, for instance, that COVID nineteen was history. We knew it when it was happening to us. When we were when in America and the rest of the world, when we were watching a, a, a mob of violent people storm the capital of my country to kill lawmakers, we knew that we were looking at history. Something that people will be talking about a thousand years from now. 
but usually history doesn't work that way. Usually it's, it's, it's much more gradual. Um, uh, let's see here. Medium John Silver says, now that you said you have a favorite Superboy story, which one is it? It's a story from uh, quite a while ago, a long time ago, when perhaps a little boy was reading it, uh, where uh, Superboy learns that he was not the first alien baby that the Kents adopted. That, that a baby, another a little white baby, fell to Earth and the, the Kents adopted him. And he also had superpowers. But he was a little bit more of a delinquent, a little bit more of a, of a handle. And Superboy knew nothing about it. They did not tell him about it. And there was, it was uh, kind of touching. The whole of it was kind of touching. As, as usual, the first story that came out in the 1950s, the writer just had a yarn to tell and didn't want to dig into the psychology of it. But good God, the psychology of it is hard to miss, even for a kid. Uh, I, I, it touched me. It was touching in a way that probably the author did not intend. Uh, let's see here. Isaiah Armstrong says, does William Shire's Rise and Fall of the Third Reich stand up as a work of history today? I believe it does, very much so. Uh, would I be better off reading a newer history of the Third Reich like Richard Evans' three volumes? If not, what other histories of the Third Reich would you recommend? Well, keep in mind here when you say better off, I don't agree with that kind of a, of a cost analysis of reading history. I don't think it's fair that we do that with history and we don't do it with so many other kinds of writing. You know, like for instance... If you would never say to me, does Henry Fielding's as Tom Jones stand up, or should I read a more recent novel? You would never do that. You you would assume that even though centuries have passed, the value that it had, it still retains. And I don't know why old history is never read anymore. It's just it's put on this kind of productivity scale where where Prescott can't be great anymore because other people have written about the conquest of Peru. So later people have written about the conquest of Peru. So why read him anymore? I don't agree with that at all. Uh, whether or not the point, the specific points of research pass by uh, a certain work of history is only a small commentary on that work. If it does a bunch of, if it's a great work of history, as the rise and fall of the Third Reich is, there's a bunch of other stuff going on. We still read Tacitus. We still read Livy. I hope we do, without condescension or too much condescension. I, I, I have never liked that idea that that history has to be the newest and latest thing. That can be interesting in a new work of history, but it doesn't invalidate the old work of history at all. You should definitely read The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Evans' books on his trilogy on the Third Reich are really good. Michael Burley's one-volume book on the Third Reich is really good. But so is so is The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by a guy who was there to see it happen. Uh, so I, 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 this business of it, of it being, uh, of it standing up as a work of history, I think it does just fine mainly because I think we need a little bit broader view of what a work of history actually is <laughs> than just, you know, teletype latest accurate details. Uh, let's see here. Lisa Garrity says, I'd like to hear your thoughts on Cloud Cuckoo Land by Door, or if you formally reviewed it, where is the review? I have not formally reviewed it. I liked it. I liked it very much. I thought it was very good. I think it's clear the worry that I had, like I think a lot of people did, was that his first book was a fluke because his first book was so good. It was so effective. And a lot of times when you read a first book like that, uh, it's so effective specifically because the author is shooting all the cannonballs in his locker. He doesn't have anything left. He might have a three-book contract, but he doesn't have anything left. That, I think, is the source of the, the, the publishing legend about the sophomore novel slump. I don't think it's really that people have trouble writing a second novel. I think it's that most people only have one novel in them. Uh, writers who have many novels in them, writers who have boundless invention don't experience the second novel slump. It doesn't happen. I think it's a reflection of the fact that publishers lock in authors instead of just buying one book at a time, uh, which is probably a good arrangement for authors, but it ends up foisting a lot of second-rate stuff on us, the readers. Uh, but in this case, this book was tremendously strong, so I don't think I think that I can lay that where, where to rest. Uh, Chris T. says, Have you read and have any opinion on the new translation of Arabian Nights by Yasmin Seal? I have not. Uh, I'm all in favor of new translations of a work, especially one that brings in previously untranslated material, but the copy I have read about it, stripping away the Orientalism, racism, and sexism, sounds a bit like revisionism to me. Well, now maybe I'm understanding why I haven't read it. I will have to examine, I'll have to look into it. But you knew that was coming for Arabian Nights. You knew that was coming, right? It's, it's chock full of what the 21st century would call uh, racism and sexism, a whole bunch of other things, a whole bunch of other isms. It's chock full of that. 
It doesn't decrease the storytelling, wonder, and power at all, but it's not permissible. In the 21st century, it's not permissible. In the 21st century, you can be canceled for even enjoying something like that. So a translator is going to go at this, this work, which is only one thing, and try to make it into something else. And that doesn't usually work. Usually you can see that what's happening there. If, for, for example, I might point at recent translations of the Odyssey and Beowulf. It doesn't work. It's obvious when you are pushing a political agenda, a Twitter agenda. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't actually sampled it yet, so I probably should. Uh, let's see here. Uh, you have another question. Steve, you read a lot of romances. Have you ever been in love? In love with a human and not a dog? Well, who's answering these questions here, you or me? <laughs> so so you want to know, have I ever been in love, provided I answer the question along bigoted lines. <laughs> I have... Being in love with someone is when they mean a lot more to you than you mean to yourself. Being in love with someone means... Suddenly you are exalted out of yourself and your whole world becomes that other person. That does not observe species lines. That does not need to. So if you're asking as a point of interest between friends, have I ever been in love with another human being? Yes, I have been. Four or five times I have been. But I've also been in love with many non-human beings and there's nothing less or, or fraudulent about that. Being in love as opposed to loving someone, you can love someone without being in love with them. When you're in love with them, they are the air you breathe. And that doesn't have to be just human to human. <laughs> so, but, so, but the answer is yes in either case. Uh, let's see here. Robert Pena says, Hello, I know you've talked about your dislike of Joyce, but I'd like to ask if you didn't find any redeeming moments. Uh, well, sometimes the stories come to an end. <laughs> uh, as a Shakespeare fan, uh, did you at least not find a bit of interest in a section like Skill and Herbdis from Ulysses. I know from quite a few people his work is unbearable, and while I don't think he's an author everyone will enjoy, I still think there's merit. I guess I'm trying to get at a more in-depth explanation for why you feel the way you do. I think, like many others, his work has fallen into the hands of the school system and is done a disservice, often getting characterized as elitist and snobby, which there's some validity to, but I think it's wrongly placed. You've mentioned Gravity's Rainbow in the past and having liked it, which is part of why I posed this question. There's more I'd like to say and ask, but I feel this comment is too long already. It is. Well, not, it's not too long for an email. But you can see I'm reading all these questions, and that took an hour to do. Uh, but uh, it might jeopardize getting read. Oh, no. No, no, no. Long comments don't. I read everything. Uh, doesn't, you, I'm not, I don't penalize people for being my friends. It it's not, doesn't jeopardize getting read, but it is too long. What you're asking here, the editor in me immediately wants to start cutting lines from this thing. It's a, you're, you're, you're asking to know, do I like Joyce or, is he, or do I think he's entirely overrated? Do I see any merit in him? Uh, and that's a line. That's one line. That's a question. Uh, I see some merit in his earlier work. Once he started writing, Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, I don't have, think, have much merit to them. If you have to dig around that hard for the merit in them, as hard as I believe you do, then it's not worth it. Then it's the, the game's not worth the candle, so to speak. So when you don't have to do quite that much digging around, like the stories or whatnot, the Dubliners or a portrait of an artist, then, then I think there's more worth, but then the stuff just gets postmodern and insane and becomes to me, the work to reward ratio becomes hysterically too great. So, uh, so I, I, I don't know, I don't know how he's been uh, appropriated by the school system. You, Sounds like you know more about that than I do. Uh, I, don't, I don't agree with that, of course. I, even an author I don't like, I don't want that to happen to them. But he hasn't done it for me. I don't think he's going to. <laughs> I've given him a lot of chances. I don't think he's going to. Uh, let's see. Thunder Turtle says, How do you get your hair to be so lush and smooth? <laughs> Clean living. Uh, James Holder says, What do you think of the new Maria Theresa biography? It's a doorstop. It's by Barbara Stolberg Rillinger, translated from the German. I think it's from Princeton Press. It's really, really good, uh, but it is incredibly thorough, and it is not trying to interest you in the subject. It assumes you are already interested in the subject, and maybe to a surprising degree, already a little knowledgeable about the subject. I found that a little, a little surprising. Not that a specialist, that a scholar would write such a book, but that an American academic press would commission a translation of such a book, knowing that. Uh, I'm very glad that it happened. It is clearly by a wide margin, the best thing that has ever been written about Maria Theresa. So if you are already interested in the subject, or you don't mind a little heavy going, I can certainly recommend it. Uh, let's see here. Alan says, Hi, Steve. Have you ever been ambushed by cake? 
what Alan is referring to here is the ongoing clown car circus show of uh, Boris Johnson in the UK, who uh, last year made a whole, agreed, authorized a whole bunch of repressive uh, pandemic rules. You can only meet with so many people for such an amount of time in such, a, in such and such a space and no more. You can't visit. You can't go out. You can't do X, Y, and Z. You certainly can't have parties with strangers. You can't do that. He put those into law, and a lot of people, the British people, a lot of people, the people who didn't obey those rules were fined, sometimes heavily for them, and the vast majority of the country did obey those rules because they were being good citizens, good fellow citizens to each other. They wanted to get over this as quickly as possible, and it has come to light in the last few weeks in UK politics, it's the only thing in UK politics, uh, that... While Boris Johnson was imposing those rules, he was blatantly flaunting them himself. And there's all sorts of documentary evidence, memos, photos, all sorts of things. But he was going to parties. And because he is utterly incapable of simply telling the truth, ever. I'm not saying that he's exactly the same as Donald Trump, uh, but they have one quality in common. And I would say, if anything, Johnson has it worse than Trump. He is incapable of simply looking at you and telling the truth about anything. About anything. Anything. Even when it's completely trivial. If he showed up at a party that you had at your flat, and you said, well, you're a little bit late, and he said, yeah, I just couldn't get a taxi, it's extremely likely that he walked. That, that, that he didn't have trouble getting a taxi, and that's why he's late, that he didn't get a taxi at all, that he lied about it for no reason at all, none whatsoever. And he doesn't take much trouble to hide the fact that he's lying, but it, naturally, when this evidence has started to come out, he has lied his face off about what went on. His story has changed half a dozen times about what explains those parties, and one of his, one of his more ridiculous uh, defenses is that he was ambushed by cake, that he was in his office working diligently as the hardest working prime minister in UK history, when suddenly some underlings, who I'm sure have been fired and maybe executed since then, came in with cake because it was his birthday. Do you honestly expect him to turn them away? <laughs> and to which I would say, your rules told your citizens that they did have to turn people away, and plenty of them did that. But you didn't. And on top of that, that would be one answer. But the other answer would be you're obviously lying your face off. You knew what was happening. You wanted it to happen. The question now is, will this bring down his government? Will this mean Boris Johnson goes? Will he get a vote of no confidence? I'm amazed that it hasn't happened yet. And I know why it hasn't happened yet. Because the loyal apparatchiks that want him to keep going, because they're making a bundle out of his premiership, are counting on an indisputable fact of the 21st century, which is that if you wait two weeks, the public forgets. Anything. Anything. <laughs> Unless you keep diligently reminding them, they keep forgetting. Because of social media. Because social media has eroded the attention span of the ordinary adult. I'm amazed that he's still here. He should already be fighting a vote of no confidence. And as far as I know, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, but no, I have never been ambushed by cake. And neither has Boris Johnson. Uh, anyway, uh, Tripp says, How well do you understand Hinduism, and what are your thoughts on it? I think I understand it pretty well. Uh, it's a gigantic world religion, so I've studied it. I've studied them all, uh, all the gigantic world religions. I, I think some of its scripture is quite lovely, and even in translation, which is the only way that I've read it. I think some of its moral strictures bring out the best in its adherents. What I think about it more generally is something you're already going to know. I object. I have some longstanding, just categorical objections to all religions because they make a practice run out of what is, in fact, the whole show. This is the whole show. You are not going to live after you're dead. You did not live before you were born. There is no continuation here. Continuation here. This is it. This is all you get. And religion might, it might give you some solace against being afraid of dying, but it also blunts the urgency of being here. And I don't like anything that does that, whether it's drugs or alcohol, whether it's religion, whatever it is. I don't like anything that blunts the urgency of being here. And that is the sole purpose of religions. So, uh, well, that and to fleece their flocks. <laughs> but, uh, but I think I understand it. Uh, certainly, I've, I've had some uh, practicing Hindus, also many, many practicing Buddhists, uh, come to me and say that it's not a religion. <laughs> so, but but uh, aside from fault or all like that, I, I think I understand it fairly well, and I like it fairly well, But uh, except for that. 
my my main my biggest objection with religion is that uh, uh, let's see here um, Helen Utzinga says do you know how to use snowshoes I do yes hopefully it won't be required even here the, Vermont is not going to hit hard by this blizzard uh, how are we doing for time we're fine uh, Nose Army says when is your 29th birthday math is complicated best not to think about it <laughs> uh, Nick Piccarilli says I'll add myself to the list that were to join more starter kits yes yes indeed my question is, number one, do you think that writing your own books has made you a better reviewer? Are you implying that I needed improvement? Uh, no. <laughs> no. It's, it, it, well, maybe better in the sense of meaner. When you write your own book, when you write your own novel, you are a lot less forgiving. I, I became a lot less forgiving with the waste, the stupidity, the, the idiotic mindless repetition, the self-importance of most novelists. So maybe that helped in a way, not in any way that they would appreciate. Uh, and number two, how do foxes compare to other canines from your experience? They're wonderful. They're absolutely wonderful. I love them. Face smooching with a fox is a very nervous experience, very close to Frida in that sense. Uh, they're, they are wonderful. They're wonderful people. I, I love them. But then again, I love all my babies. Uh, Let's see here. Edward Gibbon says, Hey, Steve, I'm terribly sorry if this has been asked before, but which novelists in the canon are your favorite writers of dialogue? Uh, wishing you love and all the best. Had to, add, had to work that in. I'm surprised you didn't start with, oh, hope you are well, said with palpable boredom. The, the, I hope you're doing well, only w said with palpable boredom, which has become this inescapable fad that I can't wait to see die. Uh, because you don't hope I'm well. I don't care whether or not you hope I'm well. Whether or not you hope I'm well is not part of a business communication with a book publicist. And if you say it in a bored tone of voice, you're just underscoring the fact that you don't care one way or another, which is called a lie. Uh, but I won't, I won't attribute that to you. <laughs> but I have too many. I have too many writers of dialogue of uh, in the canon to pick one. There are all kinds of ways of doing it. You can do it in the fevered way of a Dostoevsky. You can do it in, a, in the more sensuous way of a Virginia Woolf. But they, there are too many for me to pick just one. Uh, that's a whole video on its own, uh, dialogue in books. Uh, let's see here. Hamilton Thompson says, Hello again, Steve. You've mentioned that the PBS News Hour is a nightly watch there at the old farmhouse. Yes, uh, with Mark Richardson. I wonder which other news sources would you consider reliable? Dare I say fair and balanced? Well, okay, uh, even PBS Newsnight is not completely reliable. Even there, people are choosing things for reasons. They're choosing stories, they're choosing emphasis in those stories, ways to tell those stories for reasons. And that means that once somebody starts doing that, that introduces an element of unreliability. Like, for instance, just the other night on the PBS NewsHour, there was a long segment about the, the struggles of the U.S. postal system, uh, how they're, they're understaffed and they're working hard to get packages out despite uh, COVID restrictions in warehouses. And there was all sorts of loving footage of those warehouses and lots of interviews with postal workers. And it was maybe a 10-minute piece. And you go eight and a half minutes into that piece before any mention is made of the current postmaster general, a huge Trump supporter, who has violently attacked the efficiency of the U.S. postal system. As a matter of fact, it is a matter of fact that he has done that. He is the reason, in other words, for all of the problems in the first eight minutes, and yet he's not even mentioned, and then only in passing, until way, way into the piece. And that is because somewhere along the line, the crafter of that news article and the producer of that piece said, I don't want this to be political. Well, it is political if the political appointee is the reason for the problems you're talking about. But somewhere along the line, somebody had to say that, and that makes that story unreliable. It, it, it gave the strong impression that the Postmaster General is just a bit player in the story that he entirely caused. So uh, I, I don't take them as gospel anyway. They are, they are a lot better for the soul than the more outrightly fractious news organizations, but they're not pure as the driven snow. Instead, the way to do it is to, is to intake many, many sources and then do your own thinking. Balance them yourself. What what can I what do I know is factually true? What seems like opinion? What looks like a judgment call? That sort of thing. Uh, uh, and you all, you had a follow up, yes. Uh, also, do you watch Dr. John Campbell's channel? Must view. It is must watch YouTube. Dr. John Campbell's channel. Yes, I watch it religiously. Uh, his analysis of the pandemic has been wonderfully enlightening. He has indeed. 
He has indeed been wonderfully enlightening. I, the, I've mentioned him on this channel a couple of times before. Those of you who do not go to his channel, Dr. John Campbell, on COVID, just go to YouTube and type in John Campbell COVID, and you'll get his channel. Just subscribe, and you will know what's going on with COVID. And you won't talk about a reliable news source. He's not affiliated with anybody. He has no producer. He's just a doctor who knows exactly what he's talking about and balances the information. He assesses the latest information right in front of you. You do it together. Only you've got his experience to help you. No, I, I, uh, I strongly recommend him. Go ahead, go ahead and subscribe to that channel. Um, stay out of the Vermont snowdrifts, my friend. Well, there aren't any snowdrifts yet. For, for once, Vermont is getting the light end of a storm that is burying Boston. Uh, let's see here. Chris Bianchi says, Hi, Steve. Try to stay warm in that nor'easter. Uh, it might not be as bad in Vermont compared to coastal Massachusetts. Yes, indeed. Massachusetts is getting hammered as we speak. Uh, what's your favorite book that is set on a train? <laughs> I don't have a favorite book set on a train. Good Lord. Although, there was a book just at the beginning of this channel, so it must have been 2016, called uh, Compartment 9 or something like that. I'm blanking completely now on the name of the author, but it was very good. It's a slim little thing. I think a work in translation about a woman who's, who's traveling across vast distances in, in uh, I think, Russia, when a, a big, ungainly man joins her in her compartment, and the book is about that journey. I'll have to remember to see if I can find that. I might even have reviewed it. Was it compartment number nine? Was that what it was? But I, I don't know. It would be my favorite book. But anyway, uh, what's your favorite Mary McCarthy novel? I'm going to go with the crowd here and say Birds of America. Wonderful thing. Uh, would you recommend The Pride of Miss Jean Brody by Muriel Spark? I enjoyed the movie, but haven't read the book. Oh, my God. Yes, I would recommend the book. Absolutely. Although, much as I love my beloved Muriel Spark, I will point out that uh, Maggie Smith in the movie, The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, is yet another in a near-infinite example of the movie being better than the book. Just say it, as the kids say. Uh, Julie, Al all right, we're a little bit over, but we've got a few questions left, so we'll finish this up. Julie Alvar says, I dip in and out of most BookTube channels, but yours, I never miss an episode. There's something wrong with you people. <laughs> I was wondering if you could give your opinion of Voyage by Sterling Hayden. It's very good. Very good book. Uh, if I choose to read it, I have to grapple with holding a real book, something I've avoided since discovering the joys of reading on my beloved Oasis. I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. I get a lot of books when I'm up here in Vermont, but my go-to thing is to just, just read to my heart's content with complete ease on the iPad. Uh, uh, also because you can't find an e-copy. Well, I don't know if there's an e-copy of Sterling Hayden out there. I wonder if any of my e-boys would know if there's a copy of Sterling Hayden's books out there. Forgive me, Mr. Spock. I sometimes expect too much of you. <laughs> but if there isn't an e-book, either way, I do recommend it. I do indeed recommend it. And uh, the standard um, offer applies here. If you are leery of buying things on Amazon or eBay, and I don't blame you if you are, because there are horror stories, there are liars out there, and you want me to find a copy of, of Sterling Hayden's Voyage, I will. I can almost certainly do that, and I'd be happy to look for you, uh, and then send it to you, so you have a physical book that way. Also, wondering if Sacagawea by Ann Waldo is worth the 1,400-odd pages. It is. It's a very good book. Uh, and one last thing. Would you consider doing a video on the 10 best nautical novels? Yes, I've had a few emails about this from people saying not only do they want me to do the 10 best nautical novels, but they want me and Mark Richardson to do the 10 best nautical novels while we're together up here at the house. I will put it to him. He's in, he's in a stage now. I mean, he's a busy guy anyway. You all know that if you watch his channel. He's, he's, he's not just sitting around reading and writing all day long. He's a, he's a busy guy anyway. And in addition to that, I, you, a lot of you who make BookTube videos will know what this feels like. In addition to that, there, are, there can be peaks and valleys in your interest in doing BookTube. It has nothing to do with anger or irritation or anything like that. It's just a peak in a valley. I don't experience it, but he is, I think, right now in a, in a kind of a valley when it comes to actively wanting to do BookTube. Might, might have something to do with the fact that his little man cave with all the books around it that all of you love so much when he films out there, it's like 10 degrees below zero out there. So he doesn't, maybe that has something to do with him not wanting to go out there and make videos. Uh, but I will work, either on a... Uh, a video about nautical fiction myself, or a video about nautical fiction with the two of us. Uh, then Nick Micarelli says, I'll add myself to the list that would enjoy starter kits. Oh, wait, that's a repeat. We did that already. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next one. John Stanley says, what do you think of Philip Larkin's jazz writings? So far, they're the Larkin I like the most, which is pretty bad for his poetry. Uh, I need to fix that about his poetry. 
Uh, do you enjoy Kenneth Tynan's criticism? It's brilliant. It's just, it's like a cool drink of water on a hot summer day. It's just wonderful. And then, which was the best cinema experience? Star Trek 1, 2, 3, or 4? Uh, I don't know about best anymore. I really don't. I, wa I watched Star Trek 3 many dozens of times in the theater. It's by far the record of the number of times I've seen the same movie in the theater in person. So that's going to take it for me, even if it's not the best experience. I wouldn't know anymore. I'm not able to be objective about it. Um, see you tomorrow for 12.2K q and I think we can wait a week before we hit 12.2K. And then finally, William Fett says, what are your thoughts on Edna Ferber? I love her. I think she's great. Uh, P.D. James, I love her even more. I think she's great. And Herman Wu, I love him too when he's good. He's not as universally good. Edna Ferber and P.D. James are good pretty much on a, a steady register of excellence throughout what they write. And that's not true of Herman Wu. When he's good, he's really good. Winds of War is a terrific book. But when he's when he's just sort of uh, stem winding, then it, he's not quite so good. Uh, and uh, I would very much like to hear, oh, let's see here. Will the moose story ever get a 30-minute video? I would very much like to hear that tale. Someday, all of you will come over to Hyde Cottage. We'll take Frida on a nice long walk, and then we will settle into wine and calzones, and I will tell you the moose story. <laughs> but anyway, this is a long video, but this is the last of them. That was the last of them, because we just did a Q&A a day ago. So this wraps that up. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.